welcome to the podcast, Food Talks. I'm Dallas Townsend. I will be your host. And I act as the uninformed consumer asking a nutritionist all the questions that you have. Hello, I'm Jordan Townsend. I'm our resident nutritionist here at Naturally You, and I'm here to inform the uninformed consumer, answering and helping to unpack some of your more difficult nutrition questions. All right, so welcome back today. We were going to have the pregnancy podcast, but I'm pretty sure we're going to move that one to next week. We lost Miss Shack. Today, we're going to be talking about low-carb diets, and if you should go on one, the benefits, and if they really work. Well... They, this is kind of a good topic because a lot of our clients and listeners have actually kind of been through this already, especially back in, if you remember, kind of, it was more early 90s, Atkins. That was the one that busted onto the scene, and it was kind of the start. Because if you really look, our food changed so dramatically in this country. There's this hard line drawn in the sand at the end of World War II. Because if you look before World War II, you got the 1900s, the 20s, and the 30s. You're going through Great Depression. There's no money even to really get a lot of these like businesses and products and things out into the market. When we come back from World War II, we had ramped up our industrialization. We we got all of a sudden where we could just we're just pumping out Twinkies. <laughs> you know, we're just pumping out assembly line cer- cereals of all types. Yeah. Exactly. So. What you really started to see was in the the 50s some, but really in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and right about the 90s being kind of the peak of it. Funny enough, we looked at those charts the other day. If you follow obesity, it kind of follows, it tracks almost perfectly through those decades, increasing every single year. Well, that was part of what was causing this, was if you looked around at our food, especially, it really starts... If y'all remember the 80s, the 80s is when, is when all of this like crazy weird food started showing up. It's when you got Surge, it's when you got uh, Snowballs and just all this like super ultra processed stuff. Really peaking in the 90s with things like Capri Sun, Extreme Sour Airheads, Purple Ketchup. <laughs> yeah. We were going nuts on food for a while, and it's kind of funny because now we're in 2021. If you've noticed, we've really kind of shifted back to what? We're trying to eat plants again, Yeah. but we're not trying to just eat plants out of a can. We're trying to eat them the way they come out of the ground. So it's kind of funny as we kind of peaked right about the time Atkins and stuff was showing up because what we started to find was on top of our obesity epidemics growing, our cancer and our diabetes were growing right beside them. So what happened and what they started to identify was the main thing we had changed in our diets was all of these processed carbs. So the idea was, hey, if you can cut out all this white stuff, brown stuff, yellow stuff, you'll be able to get your weight back down and more importantly, manage it over time. So there is some some truth in that, and that's what I want to kind of go into. And then there's some kind of falsities in that, some, for lack of a better term, just they're, they're not true. They, it's what we think they are, but they don't really do that. So we can start with Atkins because Atkins was the big one. And Atkins' whole thing was instead – Atkins basically wanted you to eat fat and protein. So you're basically eating no carbs as far as rice, corn, wheat, anything like that. So the problem, though, with Atkins a lot of times is first and foremost is they would tell you order a pizza and just scrape the top off of the pizza. So again – you're not eating the crust, so you're not getting all those calories and carbs. But is the is the top? Of you a would pizza, just yeah, you would just eat cheese and, and meat sausage. and sauce. There you go, and not even the sauce really, that because that has some sugar. So they would really want you to eat more just the cheese and the meat. But as you know, is that healthy? If you order a pepperoni pizza from Domino's and just eat the top of it, you, you've reduced part of the calorie consumption. But there's no there's no nutrition there. Well, I know back then they. Probably didn't have it at all, but nowadays they have cauliflower crust. Would that technically be carb-free? Not carb-free, but way better. Now, okay. some of them are pure cauliflower through and through. Those are going to be way, those are going to be your truly low-carb, and that's what we're calling it now. We don't call it Atkins anymore. We call it keto. That's what you see on everything. Mm-hmm. It's keto-friendly, and that's what they're trying to tell you. Hey, this is low and refined carbohydrates. So that was Atkins' whole thing when it first came out, was you can eat high calories. You can eat still about 1,500, 2,000 calories a day, and you can still lose weight. That was how this whole thing was worked. So basically, they'd want you to eat steak. 
They wouldn't want you to eat the mashed potatoes. They wouldn't want you to get french fries. They, perfect example, a hamburger. Lose the bun. They'd want you to just eat the burger, the lettuce, the tomatoes, and all that. So what they were getting on to here, basically, was it, it, it worked to, to a degree. Because mm-hmm. the biggest, this is what I tell my clients nowadays doing keto, and we'll go into the other side of this whole coin, which is that's the new low-carb one we're doing, is the problem with Atkins is meat turns to sugar, Dallas. So the biggest thing most people don't realize is half of that steak that you eat, even though it is satisfying, it is filling, half of it is your body's going to turn into sugar. The other half is not. So that's why, as far as the ketogenic scale goes, carbs are not ketogenic, fats are 100% ketogenic, meat's your middleman. So that's where Atkins was kind of missing the boat a little bit. People were still eating all this meat, though they were eating more fat which was satisfying them. They were still eating stuff that would convert into sugar, causing the same problem they were trying to avoid. Now, the difference in what really helped people with Atkins more than anything is the same thing that helps them with keto. Certain foods make you hungrier. Certain foods make you feel full. That's what we've kind of discovered with fat and things like Mm -hmm. that. Whereas if you eat perfect examples, you eat french fries. Well, heck, you can eat a whole plate of french fries and have no problem with it. Whereas if you change that over to, let's just say, let's just say it was something like an order of cauliflower, just seasoned and and, uh, sautéed, you get halfway through, what happens? You stop eating. Yeah. So this is where the whole low-carb thing gets weird. Did you have a question? You go ahead. I was going to say, one, cauliflower doesn't taste as good as a plate of fries, but... You can fill up on fries, but you're probably going to be hungry within an hour. Well, and it's not that it doesn't taste as good. I know what you're saying, but what it is is it's a higher, it elicits a higher reward based on what's present. So fries are just a pure starch log deep fried. So you just added oil and you added starch. So your brain, more importantly, you added salt. Those are three essential, new, those are three essential building blocks for life. That's why, if you ever notice, we don't like plain food. It's not because we don't like things unseasoned. The more you get per bite, the the more benefit. More importantly, go back 10,000 years. If you're just eating one type of plant, you're going to be in trouble. But if you can mix three or four different types of plants with some fish and some olive oil, whoa. The reason that tastes good, I'm doing a hard quotation here, is because your body says, hey, you just opened us up. Instead of getting one macronutrient... In the exact same meal with adding olive oil and salt, you just got three macronutrients. They've had French fries since 1789. <laughs> you had to look up where yeah, I was wondering how long they'd been eating them. That's actually kind of scary because that's like 15 years after we won our independence. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, what does a fried potato look like back then compared to, you know, they didn't have grease, greasers to drop them in or whatever. Well, for sure. As you probably noticed, they'll float to some degree. So again, mm-hmm. you turn them over. All of that to say, you say a French fry tastes better. A French fry has more things that typically are rare. We talked about this. The reason we like sugar, the reason we like salt, the reason we like oil and fat is because those things are very hard to come across in nature. Or like, used to be. And, and again, no, they still are. Again, that's what I tell all my clients. Go out in the woods. Bring me back something sweet. Well, if it's not springtime right now, good luck. You can come back and go, man, it's terrible out there, Jordan. It's hard. That's why your body prioritizes sugar so high and salt so high and fat so high. The problem is every single food we eat today is going to be seasoned. Are you crazy? You're not going to put salt on my eggs? You're not going to put a little milk or butter in there to fluff them up? We do this because it tastes better, but the reason it even tastes better is because it has those extra ingredients. I tell you all of that to go back to what we're talking about. The real difference between the cauliflower and the french fries, the french fries are almost 100% starch, meaning the second you eat it, turns almost immediately converted into glucose, whereas the cauliflower is going to be more high fiber. And fiber is kind of the, it's the, it's the golden child, if you will, because it's the carb that doesn't affect you negatively. And that's what we offer. We're all scared of carbs all the time. I always try to reemphasize this. The carbs you need to be scared of are the white, brown, and yellow ones. The ones that are going to convert immediately over into glucose. The ones that are going to spike your insulin. The ones that are going to make you what? Eat more carbs. That's, and that's the problem with the french fries. It's not the french fries. More importantly, do a little test. 
go get some potatoes, cut them up, and just fry them. No salt, no butter, no no additional seasoning. They'll be okay, but they're not going to taste like the ones you get at a restaurant. They're not going to taste like you would maybe the ones that are going to make you overeat. So remember, all of these foods, more importantly, all these corporations are hacking the machine. They know what makes you want more. So they tweak their formulas and their ingredients. They're, they literally have flavor scientists that work for Frito-Lay, that work for Pepsi, that work for all of these companies because their job is just to sell more. It's not to make sure you got enough vitamin A. I need you to buy more Cheetos. So we back up. There is no company that produces cauliflower. Cauliflower is cauliflower. So that's kind of the issue. Now, you can doctor up cauliflower. You can add a little olive oil and some seasoning. But the real difference is even if you over-season and even if you fry it, even if you cook it the exact same way, the makeup. So this is what we really got to get down to. All carbs are not created equal. Half of that cauliflower is fiber. All that means to me and you is it cannot be converted into energy. So if it can't be converted into energy, it can't spike your blood sugar. It means your pancreas isn't included in it. It means your liver has no job to do. And your body just expels it. More importantly, no, it's nutrition for the good guys. Remember, your good bacteria eat everything you don't. That's why even just the fiber. Fiber is their fuel. Okay. So that's what that's what you really that's what we really forget more than anything is remember, the reason we need fiber has nothing to actually do with us. Yeah, it helps us go to the bathroom a little bit more. But what fiber really is is there's these slow acting bacteria in the gut and there's these quick opportunistic staph, strep, E. coli, all that kind of stuff. They like sugar. They like simple carbs. That's why staff and things, given a chance, will cause disease. They'll actually overtake and divide indiscriminately. Whereas fiber, because it's so hard to break down, the reason these are good bacteria, they have no conscience, they're not nice, they're slow acting. Meaning it can take them 7 to 14 days to fully break down and actually consume that fiber. So that's what that's why they're not bad bacteria. They're they're so slow they can't become pathogenic. They can't have an explosion in their numbers and overtake a section of your colon. That's what C diff will actually do. And sometimes when C diff gets so bad, the only solution is they have to t- find where the infection is and clamp off both sides of your colon and cut it out. Cuz it, otherwise it'll actually fully colonize the colon. So that's how crazy opportunistic some of these bacteria are. So that's why I want to get back to the carbs specifically. All carbs are not created equal. And you know this though, Dallas. Have you ever had one of those little those little trays that has like lettuce? Sorry, not lettuce. It's got broccoli. It's got carrots. It's got like, uh, what's the other one? The spicy one. Uh, celery. You ever eaten one of those? It's got the little ranch. You can dip it in. No, nah, I mean... I've, You've seen them, though. I've seen them, yeah. Well, that's the thing. You don't really get excited for them, do you? No, that's why I've never eaten one. That's what I was just about to say. Was, those are all carbs, by yeah. the way. Carrots are actually even pretty high starch. So carrots are actually not a low-sugar food at all. But eat those. You eat, like, one head of broccoli, you walk away from the tray. You're like, that was actually not fun at all. Let's flip that coin. Someone comes in with Shipley's Donuts. It, the Everyone in the room... Like hawks will descend like on Like Stanley and Pretzel Day. There's not a lot of good things in my life. At least there's Pretzel Day. <laughs> That's what people don't understand. Those are all carbohydrate sources. They could not be different. And what the difference is, is one is pressing this dopamine button. One's not. The reason broccoli and celery don't press the dopamine button is because no, no part of conscious you can use it. Your bacteria, your gut flora are happy. But that's what's weird. That's why you don't ever get the that's why you don't overeat salad that's why you don't overeat squash and zucchini so are there any tricks into tricking your brain into being okay with a low-carb diet so it's not that it's not about tricks what a lot of it comes from is actually gut flora and that's kind of why i wanted to talk about a lot of this is they actually have started to find out because we'll get to in a second but keto a lot of the benefits from keto aren't from eating high fat diet. It's from when you lower your carbs that much and change to high fat, a lot of those bacteria that eat the simple carbs die off. More importantly, a, a completely new strain of bacteria starts to take over. They can actually process fat. They're in that same category as the ones that can process fiber. 
So they think that's actually where a lot of the health benefits from keto come from, is your gut flora basically does a 180. So instead of having all these pathogenic, inflammatory, stressful pathogens in there, they all die off. And more importantly, these new ones show up, ones that are more efficient at helping you process fat, more importantly, ones that can actually help support your digestion, not harm it. So that's what's even weirder, is wait, you're telling me, Jordan, it doesn't even have to do with the carbs directly? No. It's what they are supporting and what they're not supporting. So that's what's even weirder, is we want it to be, okay, I eat ice cream and that ice cream hurts my stomach. No. You eat ice cream with that ice cream and sugar help support candida and fungus and stuff in your gut. That's why you have bloating. Where's all that gas coming from? Remember, a lot of these bacteria can... We know how alcohol gets made, right? Mm -hmm. Bacteria eat sugar, alcohol, and CO2. Why do you think your beer is bubbly? Is the byproduct. So a lot of that gas and bloating and pain is because those bacteria are consuming it and CO2 and other gases are byproducts. I know we've talked about the uh, gut biome before, but it's have they made any more strides in that advancement? I feel like may, they should just make pills that will go in and just... We talked about change it on a dime. Remember? That, yeah, but I don't know. It just seems like there's so much power to harness here that the problem we're on the cutting edge. All all of this research is in the last ten years. Because remember, I, we talked about it a little bit, and I don't want to rehash too much. But human genome project started in the '90s. They expected, hey, we're gonna we're gonna sequence every gene. By about 2000 ish, they had it. But medicine didn't change any. <laughs> it turns out one gene codes for your eye color, your skin color. It helps you produce liver enzymes, and it helps decide if your nails are brittle or not. So how do you can't change someone's gene on their nails to make them less brittle because now they're they have no eyesight. Mm -hmm. So it, that was the issue. Is also it wasn't as many genes as we thought. Something like three hundred thousand. Enter two thousand eight, two thousand nine. They, they took some bacteria from the gut, and they sequenced their genome. One single bacteria had 1.2 million genes. So, yeah, that kind of woke us up to, we thought we were the complicated ones, right? Because we're advanced life, Dallas. We're yeah. mammals. We have these big brains. We have these social dynamic. No, our genes have not needed to be that complicated. Whereas, imagine being a bacteria. There's only another billion different types of bacteria that you're fighting with, warring with. That's just bacteria. We didn't even talk about viruses. We didn't even talk about bacteriophages, which are essentially, if you want to really, real quick, bacteria are the antelope, bacteriophages are the lions. So there's a different subspecies that simply preys on bacteria. <laughs> then you got parasites, then you got fungus. So welcome. You need 1.7 million genes if you're going to stay on top of this and stay around. More importantly, if you can't absorb that bacteria that you want, went to war with and won and take on some of their adaptations, you lose the next round. So it's crazy. So that's what they really started realizing was we need to be influencing these things in our gut more than we need to be trying to influence our personal genes. Because that's what I wanted to flip back to on the other side of this. I have a saying a lot of times, if you're ever walking through Walmart, I say Walmart, not even Walmart, Home Depot, that's an easier one. If you're walking through Home Depot and you just get a hankering for a Wendy's Frosty, that's not you. You personally, the human, don't want a Wendy's Frosty. Those bacteria in your gut that use lactose and simple sugar to, to reproduce and divide are getting hungry. So they come and they knock on the door. They can actually secrete chemicals that make you hangry. So this is what's so hard to get through people's heads. You think you want a donut. You don't want a donut. <laughs> These things living in your body are making sure they don't run out of fuel. That's why a lot of times when people go into keto, that's what keto flu is. A lot of that is die off of these old things that have, have huge colonies that have existed for decades. Well, you just stop eating sugar all of a sudden, they're not going to be happy. So they're not going to go quietly out the back door. So that's where, to say all of that. The low-carb impact is actually way more in the gut than it is physically maybe on the heart and on the pancreas, on the liver. Now, I want to talk about those, too, because those are also very important things that reducing your... Because, again, I can't say this enough. It's not about reducing your carbs. It's about reducing your simple processed carbs. 
like I said, chips, crackers, cookies, cakes, pastas, breads, pastries, the obvious things. I always tell people, the things you want to eat. Of course, if I asked you, hey, Dallas, do you want a salad or do you want pizza? Uh, I get a choice. I'm going to go with pizza. Yeah. Because it's going to press more dopamine buttons. But if you were to really break down your biology as if you were a machine, right? That's why it's always, I, always, I always laugh at video games, right? Play a video game like The Sims or something. Well, your person's an artist and they work out and they get 12 hours of sleep every night and they have a big fit friend group. Well, it's easy when you don't have to actually do those things. You can just tell somebody, hey, eat healthy. Because that's what's weird. If you really looked at your body like the machine that it is, our diets would look completely different. But pretty much, first off, we would drink 100% water. <laughs> no person would really drink anything other than water unless it was alcohol for a celebratory reason, right? Because water is the chemistry of life. So if you're drinking Coca-Cola, your body now has to do something to extract what little water is in there out. More importantly, that takes energy. That's work for your liver. That's work for your pancreas. That's the simple carbs that I'm talking about. Because the, what ends up happening is if you eat kale, kale is pretty much all positive. If you eat a saltine cracker, it's pretty much all negative. Besides being inflammatory, besides being nothing but essentially sugar, besides the work your organs have to do, last but not least, what value did saltine add other than calories? What, what, what nutrition's in a saltine cracker? There's no vitamin A. There's no vitamin C. There's no vitamin D. There's no trace minerals. So what, that's what people don't get. You're eating something that's basically just sugar. Yeah. Just repackaged. Same thing goes for lima beans even. People think, oh, I'm eating lima beans, Jordan. Those are healthy. Look up the carb con the starch content of lima beans. They're also legumes too, so they're not even vegetables. That's a big reason why. But... That's just a bunch of stuff that's going to turn straight to sugar. So if you were going to, you know, recommend a diet, is it more particular on the person and their... Always. Okay. So a lot of this is to genetics, right? This is what's hard to deal with is in, in America specifically. We're the country of immigrants, right? So the problem is we brought our genetic backgrounds with us. So we have African Americans. We have Irish Americans. We have Chinese Americans. We have Native Americans. Well, none of them are going to be able to process and handle sugar the same because every single one of those genomes goes back to the last 10,000 years. Of Yeah, one was on the Asian continent, one was on the African continent, some were on the European continent, and some were on the true North American continent. So how many generations of even dealing with high processed carbs do you have? We talked about this. This is why Europeans, white Europeans specifically, more around like Europe, Norway, Germany, Handle it better than anybody on the planet. Why? Those kings had access sooner. They went to South America. They brought back sugar. They went, whoa. So they started importing sugar from day one. Whereas you look at, where where were they growing sugar cane on the African continent? Where were they growing sugar on the Chinese continent? They weren't. It's not that they can't now. They don't import it now. But years and years of genetics... People go, our pancreas is never prepared for this level of sugar consumption. We talked about this, too. That's why island nations, specifically, Polynesian-type people, Hawaiian, extremely sensitive to our Western diets because these were people who lived in famine their whole is life. Is that why the Polynesians are kind of a reputation for being kind of bigger nowadays? Only, only once they get colonized. Only yeah. once we export our way of living and eating to their their island. We talked about this. If you overeat on an island, you out-eat the island. They think that's what actually happened to Easter Island. Yeah. They think it was war, and basically they overexpanded their resources. Well, next thing you know, Dallas, you have to leave the island. <laughs> There's nothing left. So you have to basically be in 24-7 famine mode when you're on an island nation. I just looked up a weird stat. There's, in 2009, there was an article written that there were over 100 uncontacted tribes on the earth. Seems like a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, most of them are about fifty-ish people, and they're all in the Amazon and stuff like that. So, and that's why it's like, do we? What are we going to even do to them? Like, you know what I mean? Like, run what, tests and run or, food or, experiments. Or more, and, what, what do we add? To we're going to check their gut bacteria. That's and that's what I'm. Saying. I don't. I don't even, to be super honest with you, I think that's the next big jump in medicine. Is we need to go to these tribes. I don't know how you. 
how do you do this ethically becomes the problem. You kidnap them. I was say, the, the unethical <laughs> model is you just take one guy, get a sample from his gut, see what it is, culture it, see how... Because what it is, I would love to just see his versus mine. Yeah. Because his is generation after generation of eating out of the forest. I mean, they're just eating animals and plants. And they're getting some right? fruit. Well, fruits are there. But they're not drinking coke. When they grow. They're right? not they, eating pizza. When you can find them. Yeah. When you can kill an animal. That's you can what, follow him around and, like, look in his scrap pile. And, and see, that's just <laughs> what we take for granted is that we have this access. And this is what I really want to talk about with the whole low carb thing. More than anything, the access is what's killing us. For the longest time, Dallas, if you wanted fruit, you had to wait until fruit came into season. We picked the fruit. Hey, for a few months, guys, we're going to have dates. That's also why dried fruit is such a like a historical food. They figured out if you can dry these things out, they last longer. That wasn't necessarily someone trying to make it anything. It's just, hey, this way it'll stay around. So this access to low carb is what's killing us because our bodies and our brains are still in famine survival mode. So when you eat a piece of chocolate, especially one that has milk added to it for fat, because by the way, if you've ever had chocolate, chocolate's extremely bitter. It doesn't taste good at all. Also, true chocolate is actually super high in things like magnesium, zinc, chromium. Chocolate actually has a bunch of the trace minerals in it specifically. But it's because where chocolate's grown. It's grown in the Amazon, some of the most rich, fertile soil in the world. The problem, we melt it down, we add milk, we add, we add uh, fat, and then we add sugar. So now you've denatured and changed this so far from what it actually started as that now it's this basically unhealthy piece of sugar, for lack of a better term. So that's what's getting us more than anything. Is our brains were never set up for supermarkets. What do you mean? I can get as many boxes of Frosted Flakes as I want? And I can just keep eating them as long as I want? I saw I saw an abomination yesterday in the supermarket. They make oatmeal pie cereal. So the oatmeal pies that, you, you know, people have been Jesus. eating for years. Yeah. Let's make that into cereal so you can eat about 18. Doesn't that remind per- you of Momo's, though? A little, say, bit. That's, a little bit. That and moon pies just take me back to my grandmother's house. Yeah, I like, I like moon pies better, but oatmeal's not bad. I just remember that's what she had. But no, exactly, Dallas. And they're, they're, they're somehow spinning that as what you should break your fast with every morning. Well, it'll give you energy and you won't no, be hungry. Yeah, it'll give you calories. Turns out your blood sugar is going to spike, meaning your insulin's going to spike, your body's going to dump insulin, it's going to crash your blood sugar. And guess who's hungry by 10 a.m.? You are. That's the problem with these high-calorie, higher-processed food diets. They start a metabolic cycle that you can't break. More importantly is you can resist, but you're going to be hangry. You're not going to feel good. You're going to get shaky. You're going to be irritable. That's what's crazy about this is these companies know this. So if they can get you started on that first one in the morning, you're perfect. You're hooked. You are in the system. So that's what we got to figure out more than anything is – you can still eat some of these things, but make them a treat. I always tell you, if you're doing something every day, that's entirely, that's not a treat anymore. If you're doing something every week, it's still not really a treat. That's 52 times a year. If you're doing something once a month, 12 times a year, that's a treat. Yeah. Some, it's something special you do every now and then. So that's what I think is getting us more than anything, is our brains are still in survival on the savanna mode. Meaning if you found fruit 10,000 years ago and you ate it, you better find more fruit because winter's coming, and I want to make sure we got plenty of extra fat so that we don't die. But all of a sudden, Dallas, we drove to the supermarket, bought as much stuff as we wanted, drove home. So not only did we not burn any calories <laughs> while we went and hunted and gathered, right? We just got enough calories to make sure that we gain weight for the next six months. That was for just one grocery trip, much less if you go back in a week and a half. You go back in another month. So that's what ends up getting us, man, is our brains never could have imagined us having access like this to food and to calories. So it's still operating on that. Hey, if we find sugar, salt, or fat, we light the machine up and we drive them to eat more. So I've been doing since April 1st. It's about seven days in. A week, it feels like a year. I've been doing this... (laughs) 30-day detox diet. I think it's, I don't know if it's a standard process one. 
Mm-mm. This is that one is different. There, well, Center Process has a twenty one day cleanse program. That's a different thing. Okay. This is this is just a detox. I've seen your books. The so detox said, that uh, Kim gave me, and I mean, it's going good, but you really start to realize all the amazing the, foods, the you, pleasures we have. Yeah, that. You don't really have to eat, but, like, man, you would love to well, eat. Well, no, just real quick, just to kind of get – because I was wondering if you were going to talk about this, and that's why I was curious. Because this diet is extremely low-carb. Like, the man can't even have rice. Like, we went to eat, eat meal at a friend's house the other day. He had deer roast, he had rice, and he had, what, some, some mixed veggies? Yes, and I The only the thing on your – veg- On this hardcore diet Dallas was doing was the vegetables. <laughs> so, like – I don't think I have a, had a carb in a week. Well – A carbohydrate – grain a or whatever a, a simple car yeah and those simple ones are the ones that get you in trouble i mean we've been eating spinach avocado tomatoes in like salad form um how those we had movements? baked beans last night but it was with some homemade molasses and it wasn't corn syrup bowel movements have been wild if you're having stomach issues that's what i was just about to ask yeah. <laughs> i figured it out like i've been there with stomach issues solid and very few times honestly like well, that not fiber nearly takes as often. a long time to move through, too, Dallas. That's the thing is, like, a lot of times when we eat some of these simple things, like, body can just break them down and move them out. When you start eating all that big fiber, that stuff's grabbing all that crud as it goes. So it doesn't just shoot through you either. But, no, exactly. That's what's so crazy is if you really look, most diets should be about 50% raw food, 50% cooked. That's where we're screwing up to begin with. Everything we uh, we cook, we eat is baked or cooked right think about our honey buns and our mcgriddles and our sausage biscuits and our everything our cereal honestly one of the best industries to be in you know it has to be the food industry and selling food to people because one it's once, permanent. You, once you get them it's permanent they're too. hooked well, and they have to have food and they think they have to have your food they really don't because i mean i'm doing this for a week i got three more weeks left and it is hard but you know you just gotta have some willpower but if it was something you're not committed to you're gonna fail because your brain starts to tell you it's probably the gut bacteria honestly telling me that bro you really could look that, at that rice, sandwich that just look at that sandwich rice is a vegetable Dallas yeah. rice is a vegetable it's not it's a grain but I looks mean, like a vegetable close enough, right we're hungry yeah. right and that's what's weird is when you really we talked about this a lot we mean you've both done keto you did one meal a day stuff I do intermittent fasting almost every day once you start to separate yourself from food, it's crazy because you realize how long you really can go. Well, you realize be- how addicted other people are, well, the no, whole also, world. Well, you realize that Jesus well, doing 40, 40 days in the desert is doable by you. It would be horrible. wouldn't really want to wish that long on anybody, but that's doable. And that's the hardest thing I think most people deal with is like – we live in such, we, we talk about this. We live in such a cushy, safe, nice, soft little world nowadays. We don't even want to be uncomfortable, Dallas. We 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 are the we're the generation that complains when our seat is uncomfortable. So you're telling me you have a chair and you're complaining. Yeah, right. Think about how important a chair was hundreds of thousands of years ago, right? Like that's the, that's what's even wilder. So like if we're even a little hungry, if our blood sugar dips under 100, we freak out. Oh, I just I gotta get some grapes. I gotta get some crackers. I gotta get some nabs. I gotta get something in me. Like that's the problem. If our ancestors could see us, Dallas, they they are rolling over in their graves. That this is where their genes have ended up. Because remember, this is what I always try to emphasize, people. We are the winners. If you're here today, your ancestors won the war that they fought six thousand years ago. At least ago. long enough. Uh, on, at some point, right? Yeah. And more importantly, they survive the tough winter. That's why we put weight on so easily. We're the fat stores because all those other people died. So that's what's even harder about this is our genes have been selected for one single thing, survival. All of a sudden, if our, like I said, we get a little famished. Our back gets a little sore. We just complain. We whine. We go and get a massage. And then we go get we go pick up a pizza, right? So that's where this is getting out of control, is that we've gotten to this really, re- again, the, you know how we have to take tangents. I'm worried about America in 50 years. I really, it, when I'm 78, it's going to be really, really strange. I'm banking on biotechnology catching up and just offsetting all the bad food choices we've been making. I'm not even worried about our health. I don't think our country can make it. 
Why? We're, we're too soft. And that's what, hap- that's what happened to Rome. Rome fought war after war after war. They won, they expanded, they won, they expanded, they won, they expanded. And what happened? They got rich. And when they got rich, they got comfortable. And when they got comfortable, eh, you know, we're losing some, some, we're losing some land on the German front. You know, some of these German tribes are pushing back. Eh, you know, we, we own six, we have 6,000 other square miles. Like, eh, we'll let them take it. And now, you know, now they're pushing up from North Africa. Eh, let them take it. And they're push, they're pushing in from India. Uh, Next thing you know, Rome splits. They play the flute while it burns because we don't have any adversity anymore. You know how many people would lose their mind if all we had to eat going forward were actual vegetables? Real food. Real, no, no, no. real food. No like, all we have is food and meat. We like, wake up to Vegetables and meat. There's no packages. And grain, there's no boxes. There's no cans. I don't know what I'm going to do. Don't, this is a, when I tell you all these things, don't think I'm above it because I'm in the boat with you all. But I don't know what I'm going to do. Because it's going to be real tough real quick. Cause I'm just imagine if we had bags of rice, bag, like tons, baskets of vegetables, plenty of raw meat. Just here, You good just luck. couldn't throw it on a Wendy's burger. You couldn't right. deep fry french fries. How many people well, would legitimately lose their mind? Because, yeah, I like rice, but, bro, this is too much. Well, we, they really robbed us when they took home ec away because no one knows how to feed themselves anymore. And that's the, that's true. That's the scariest thing. A lot of people don't know how to cook. That's why that's why these blue aprons and green chefs and home chefs have been kind of a, a revelation in a way. Like they're, that's actually to me great. I mean, I know they can be a little pricey sometimes, and the portions maybe not be as big as we want. But guys, that's retraining you to do what humans have always done: sit around a fire, prepare your food. That's where, by the way, that's where community came from. Communication. You gotta literally have. You a can group have community in the drive-through lane of a Wendy's, right? <laughs> when you're chewing out the lady because she she put pickles on your bun. Yeah, and you're swinging on her through right. the window. That's our society. And that's what it, it's coming down to, man. We're, we're eating bad food. We're, we're working as much as we possibly can. We're all stressed out. We don't make enough money. Is anybody? That's the thing. Is we have this beautiful society. We drive around. Is anybody happy? The rich people. Antidepressant use is at an all-time high. Ask. That's who most of the people on these anti-anxiety drugs are. Are the wealthy, well-to-do people? So that's what's even scarier, right? So wait, you mean even if I got rich, I wouldn't be happy? Uh oh. <laughs> Maybe the Indians were right. There goes your American dream, though. So this was a low-carb podcast. That's where this all started. Is we're hooked and locked into this way of eating and thinking that keeps you basically stuck. Like I said, if you're in this, like you said, why am I look? Like you said, the further away you got from those simple carbs. Start looking at rice like it's a donut. <laughs> That's how weird and how sneaky these bacteria and things behind the scenes really are. And that, to me, is why low carb is important. Because I tell people, in a perfect world, most people would be about eighty percent vegetarian. Maybe the last ten to twenty percent, fifteen to twenty percent, would be meats, legumes, nuts, seeds, everything else, all the other proteins, all the other stuff. But if you just stuck to that low carb, high fiber diet. You're going to be healthy, you're going to be feel good, your joints aren't going to hurt, you're going to sleep well at night. The problem is when you start adding what? People want their cake and they want to eat it too. They want to be able to drink wine, Dallas, and get a full eight to nine hours of restful sleep. Um, That's not how chemistry works and how biology works. So that's the thing is we want to be able to eat hamburgers and get hot wings and order pizza and drink beer with our friends, smoke cigarettes, not exercise. I don't know why I don't feel good. (laughs) Um, you're not doing anything your victorious ancestors did. That's why they won. So that's what, to me, is the super scariest thing, is they've almost got us not, I want to say brainwashed, but it's self-brainwashing. Because coming up in school, right? I mean, it's your- just a system set up that, like, even if you don't want to participate, it's going to be hard. Glu- going gluten-free. How how hard did we learn that? Just doing this diet in the first seven days, I've seen so many ads for food. <laughs> Whether it's on TikTok, someone's making this or that. So you think you notice them now and you weren't noticing uh, them before? Or I don't you think know. it's ads for food now? I think I was noticing them more now. I don't know. But you just look at it and you're like, man... If I wasn't so dedicated, I really like might go break this fast. But thankfully, me and my wife are in it together, right. so well, it's a little easy to hold each other accountable. But well, think about Pluto TV too. That's like a free, free to watch network. They have three commercials that come on Pluto TV: drug ads, food ads, public service announcements. That's it. 
It's political advertisements, it's drug ads, and it's food. Those are the big money makers, man. That's where all this money is. That's what's so crazy is once you realize that you're a cog. Honeycombs is just trying to sell you more cereal so that Post can post more profit. General Mills just wants to sell a few more boxes of Captain Crunch so they can post better profits. So that's what this game really is. It's not let's make a, a better cereal. Let's just make a more addictive food product. The more addictive food product, the more people eat your food, the more people eat your food, the more money you make. But you as a consumer want them to have a more addictive product because you don't want bad tasting honeycombs. Like, yeah, well, that's I, the thing. And I, I really. I, I can eat honeycombs like once a month. No, that's just gar- well, we ban, garbage. Well, we ban cigarettes to under 18, to really 21 now. But what we really need to talk about is there needs to be physical. You can't go to Colorado and buy edibles with more than 100 milligrams of THC in them. So if they can cap the amount of THC in a product, beer cannot be higher than 8%. Wine cannot be over 20%. If they can cap these things, why do we let them put as much sugar as they physically want? That's a good question. We need hard sugar caps, at least per dose, right? So let's just say a box of cereal can be no more than 100 grams in the box. It's still a lot, but right now there's no limit at all. So what's to keep them from pushing it up to 120 and to 160 and to 180 and to 200? The sugar lobby. No, no, and that's what I'm saying. They they are the ones pushing back against legislation. If you mention legislation, they're going to pour money into all their donors, and you, your bill won't even see the floor. So that's where I, that's why I'm worried, man. You can't get anything done in this country that makes sense that actually helps consumers. You got to have money. And, a, and a, a, a means to an end. Like, the reason a bill gets passed or laws get made is at the end, someone benefits. Not us. Never us. Never the people who actually, the 300 million of us who voted on a congressman. No. Some business somewhere makes money because, ah, I can now operate and provide a product that perfectly fits in this new legislation restrictions. Good. I now control the market. Well, you're able to buy that product, but that product is not good for you. But you enjoy it, so therefore you think you want. You sugar, think you're rewarded. The big three, sugar, cigarettes, alcohol. Exactly. All 100% legal. No one restricts that in any form, oh, unless you're old enough, right? Just real quick, going to do a poll. Y'all raise your hands at home. How many of y'all smoked cigarettes before y'all were 18? How many of y'all drank alcohol before you were 21? Did those laws really change anything? That's the thing. is, you, The irony is you can't advertise cigarettes on TV. Watch the Super Bowl. How many under 18 and under 21-year-olds watch the Super Bowl? It's Clydesdales. It's Beer. It's Coors. It's Miller. Interesting, right? So you can put those ads out all day long. It doesn't matter. That's fine. So it's just, again, the hypocrisy is at exponentially insane levels. More importantly... You're not going to get anything done about sugar, Dallas. There's too much. Like you just said, General Mills making too much money. Are you crazy? Twix, Twix and them are making too much money. What are you talking about? We can't put as much sugar in it. Because that's the thing. Let's say they cap it. You get a recess and you go, mm, this doesn't taste like it used to. You're not eating food anymore. You're, <laughs> you're using a drug yeah. to feel good. So that's where it gets really scary. Is once you start to see sugar in these high carb, high refined things for what they are, they're drugs. They're they're something that make you feel good, good short term, but long term what? People, Destroy. You. Well, people know junk food hurts you, Dallas, and they accept that. We know cigarettes hurt you. We accept that. We know alcohol hurts you. We accept that. Why do we not have any legislation? More importantly, we subsidize the value menu. You realize you cannot make a dollar hamburger. I guess it just goes back to freedom. It's not freedom if the government is helping a company have a $1 hamburger. Well, you can't hamburger. tell people what to eat, so freedom. You, you can't, but you can tell they the government. they make an Oreo donut. <laughs> well, you can tell the government not to make it cheap as possible to eat the least healthy food possible, right? Like, why is the government not subsidizing kale salads? Big kale doesn't have that much money. Precisely. McDonald's is a singular corporation that can go to the government and lobby for that. Whereas, how many farmers grow kale? So that's what it, this is where it really gets weird. Once you get to the product side of it, you're in trouble. There is no big cauliflower. <laughs> there is no big kale. There is no big spinach. It's just farmers who grow and sell spinach in bulk. So that's what you really want to do. Take from this low-carb thing, if anything. It's not low-carb. It's low-processed carbs. Get rid of the white stuff, the brown stuff, the yellow. Replace it with whole food stuff, even if it's sweet potatoes. 
Sweet potato at least still comes with some nutrition, whereas a, a Schubert's roll has nothing in it but calories. Like you said, too, like, if I just eat donut sticks, I'm in trouble. One, I'm going to die. You're probably going to get scurvy. Your, your teeth are going to start falling out. But more importantly is your body's not going to have anything, but you're going to become super insulin sensitive because your body said every single meal, his blood sugar spikes through the roof. So that's the thing is we know these things are problems. I just feel like we don't explain them. People know cigarettes are bad. People don't really think, case in point, go to a child's birthday party. It's cake, it's ice cream, it's cookies, it's candy. Guys, these people are five. They are the most susceptible to addiction of anybody. But it's a party. Right, we all, well, they, they like it. It makes them feel good. You know, it's, and it's just this one time, really. So they don't trick-or-treat at Halloween. They didn't get anything at Easter. They didn't get stocking stuffers at Christmas. They didn't get anything at Thanksgiving. They didn't get anything for their birthday. They didn't have anything at Fourth of July. It's like you said. Dallas was trying to figure out when to do his little detox diet. He said, man, I pretty much realized every single month. He's going to have something you're going to miss out on. If it's not a holiday, it's a birthday. If it's not a birthday, it's a wedding. If it's not a wedding, it's a bachelor party. If it's not a bachelor party, it's a vacation. If it's not a vaca- So, yeah, they've got us kind of in this stuck thing, especially if you if you work in a large office. That's the joke. Every month is somebody's birthday. So there's cake in the conference room. They brought in donuts this time. Hey, they they catered in McAllister's. You're You're stuck. You're, you're, again, yeah. and we found too, like we just said, most human willpower is, is kaput. Just living life based on all those holidays and events that are going to take place, going out with your friends, it's hard to do a low carb diet. It's almost, and again, it's almost impossible it's if nearly, you're going to participate. And the, the icing on the cake, great pun. All of this comes back to more than anything food is social. So good luck doing your weird little detox diet by yourself. Do you have no friends? Because eventually, I'm going to call you and hey, Dallas, come over. We're making, we're, we're making pasta tonight. We're going to cook spaghetti. You and Martha Ann come over. All right, I'll bring my kale chips. Right? Like, well, wait, you don't have to bring any food. I'm catering it. I got it. It's like, ah, well, you know, we're doing this. Weird. I remember, I saw this with gluten-free a lot when I first went gluten-free. Every single time I went to anybody's house ever, their mom is trying to poison me. <laughs> their mom's like, hey, honey, would you like some of this? We got some of these. The best part about it. I made cookies. I knew you were coming over. I made some chocolate chip cookies. Oh, my God. I tell this nice woman I can't eat. And I want her cookie. Like, I want to eat. I'm a, I'm a 17-year-old kid. I want a cookie. Why don't I? You know what the best part about going gluten-free in 2008, 2009-ish was? What's that? None of your friends gave any effort to actually realize what you're telling them. Yeah, I'm gluten-free. Glucose-free, huh? <laughs> can't eat sh- Gluten. And you explain it to it's them, and gluten. they'll ask you. And then they'll offer you bread, and like we just talked about our this. cousin. Are you not listening? Ben to me? still tells me all the time. He's like, is that? He'll just ask. He said, "Is that gluten free?" So there's zero effort on his part to actually commit to memory. What we call learn <laughs> what gluten is and what it's not. Exactly. He's like, oh, "Does that have gluten in it?" It's like so. And it, nowadays, we we live the life of luxury as gluten free people because. There's options. Well, it's everywhere. It's things are labeled. Those food corporations saw their dollars disappearing. Yeah. So they went in and said, "Why is Annie's monopolizing the gluten free cracker market? We're Lance." You want to know how good advertising works for gluten free? I bought uh, body wash yesterday because it said gluten free. Swear. I was looking at this one and I saw the one beside it. It said gluten free. I was well, like, "Well, that's a wait, creepy wait. one." Shampoos, conditioners, and body wash. Lots of they use these hydrolyzed wheat proteins. I didn't know that. Don't ask me why. I don't know necessarily like what they're if they help your hair because I know hair is proteins. I don't know. I don't understand the body wash as much. But yeah, no. A lot of our clients have had that happen before. They show up for wheat. They go, Jordan. Wheat was in my shampoo. It was irritating my scalp. What? What? What planet are we living on now? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We ha- we we have created problems that human biology could never even account for. By making this modern society. And this is where it gets tough, Dallas. Do you really want to go back to living in the cave? Because I don't. So this is where we have this kind of existential crisis. I'm super aware, but I like it here because it is nice. And I like cars and I like my social structure. And I like video games and online gaming and I like being able to fly on airplanes. But it's killing us. 
More importantly, it's making us unhealthy. More importantly, it's making us sick and making us not feel good. It's making it's, most of us mentally unstable. It's hurting us. It's, da- it's causing our joints problems. It's giving us type 2 diabetes. It's giving us cancer. But it feels good. So, like, you see, oh, God, we're in a weird spot because I don't want to be an Indian. <laughs> I don't want to live like someone who lives on the land. That ain't for me. But the problem is you got to try to at least, what I'm trying to emphasize more than anyone, do what you can. If you just start intermittent fasting by skipping that, that bowl of cornflakes in the morning and then you eat your normal lunch and dinner, that's something. If you start to cut out processed carbs and replace them with complex carbs, that's something. But again, you got to do something. Because again, we all we all know this, and that's what I was telling one of my clients, just a good wrap-up. Being 28, this is probably the best job I could have ever had. It's because I see what my future looks like. Any client, any male that comes in over 50, I'm like, this is why I fast. <laughs> this is why I exercise. This is why I float. This is why I do all these things to make sure because I don't want my knees to go out on me. I don't want my back to be so bad I can't play golf. Or more importantly, I can't even sit comfortably. i got people that can't sit comfortably in a recliner because they're in so much back pain from deteriorating discs and that chronic breakdown. Well, the best part is when you're, when you're 60, people will just assume that you're built different. Well, you're just your g- genetic structure is different. I have a thyroid issue. I can never. Yeah, what, what do you think? Can called? never lose weight. Well, I ate healthy for 60 years. Well, probably 50, but. But no, that person too. Remember those? They were in college in the 80s, Dallas. So drinking, smoking, eating pizza. They definitely didn't know any better back then. Process, process. Even mom, mom's early cooking for us was all cans. Velveeta shells. You remember those? My God, how many times did we, how many times do we eat those Velveeta shells? Oh, uh, several. They've got aluminum as an ingredient. You need aluminum sometimes. <laughs> aluminum has no place in the human body. Oh. I know you know that. But she was doing good, Dallas. She was cooking at home. She wasn't ordering takeout and pizza. And Speaking of aluminum, go find me a deodorant that doesn't have aluminum in it. The only one I've found is, I've showed it to you, is that coconut oil one from Ava Anderson. And it's okay, but it's kind of sticky, and it does have essential oils in it, so it can light you on fire. If you got the little bacteria colony there, it'll burn those armpits so bad. <laughs> After that, though, it won't hurt, but that first one will light you up. All right, well, we've got a little off track here towards the end, you know, kind of throwing in our personal opinions on some things. But, you know, when you talk about food, where do you get your food? It always leads back to our same system of food. You know what it comes back to? We want solutions, right? And that's why we end up talking about all that other stuff is this stuff's not changing. The people in power and control and money do not want anything to change at all. So, yeah, that's why it's kind of unfortunate. As we start talking about low-carb and what you can do, well, hey, there's one low-carb option at the grocery store. There's 180 that aren't. Plus, depending on which documentary you watch, people get really confused on what they should even do to yeah. eat healthy. Right. Please don't watch What the Health. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anything else to add on the low-carb diet um, situation? I think that's it. Keto, we've already, again, if you want to know more, I talked about the Atkins side of it. Go listen to the keto episode. That is the other side of the low carb, and I have a whole episode on keto. That's why I didn't talk about it too much on this one. Yeah, we've already died. We've already dove into that one so deep. But just really, guys, eat food the way it looks when it comes out of the ground. That simple. You almost cannot mess that up. Now, there's some levels to it, but you're going to be hard pressed. Awesome. All right. Hope you enjoyed. Make sure you like, subscribe, follow, and we will see you next time. Take it easy, folks.